Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet, a trustless open source wallet that gives you the keys to your crypto. Invoice, donate, and trade your Monero with peace of mind, peace of cake. And by Stealthy X, an instant exchange where privacy is a top concern. Go to StealthyX.io to instantly exchange between Monero and 450 plus assets without having to create an account or register and with no limits. Making StealthyX a simple way to purchase Monero with crypto anonymously. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in MoneroTalk.crypto in your Monero.com or Cake Wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman was live at the 2024 Porcupine Freedom Festival, aka Porkfest, in New Hampshire, with a panel of guests including Sterling Lujan of The Logos Project and Matt Roach, aka Monero Matt. They cover a lot of topics, including the importance of privacy, the need for cryptocurrencies like Monero, and some first hand experiences with the crackdown on crypto. The panel discusses privacy as a human right and how technologies like Monero can help protect these rights. They also talk about the challenges faced by the cryptocurrency community and strategies for promoting the adoption of Monero. Monero Talk starts now. All right, guys, guys. Um, yeah, before we go too far off a tangent on COVID, that could that could be a six-hour talk in and of itself with bird flu. Well, we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit, I'm sure. My name's Doug Tuman. This is the Monero Hub. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Not exactly sure what we'll be talking about today. I'm sure we'll go in a couple different uh, directions. But if these gentlemen would like to first introduce themselves, and then we'll we'll, we'll take it from there. Cool. Yeah, a lot of you guys know me already. My name is Sterling Lujan. I am a convict. Right, so I I was arrested in 2009 for possession of MDMA and cocaine, some 500 pills of MDMA, it's 30 30 grams of cocaine. And the reason that I think this is important to discuss this because I think a lot of us share similar experiences. I know Matt has been had close calls in, <laughs> himself, so yeah, I think this is one of the most important things we can talk about is how to fight back against a state that is completely corrupt, has that territorial territorial monopoly on violence that we talk about a lot. And trying to figure out how to push back push back against that, and that includes leveraging privacy, anonymity, and any practices that we can to secure more freedom in our lifetime. Good intro, good intro. We just met at MoneroCon for the first time. I think you know I had heard of you, and we just met two weeks ago at MoneroCon in Prague, which is which is awesome. Right, uh, right on, Matt. And you want to quickly give an intro? Sure, Matt. Yeah, um, my name is Matt Roach. Um, I was. Uh, tangentially involved in the crypto six raid uh, along with uh, one of our audience members here um actually who was more directly involved than tangentially but i was tangentially involved um i'm a pretty regular dude but i'm known as monero matt from when i hosted free talk live a little bit i spoke a lot about monero i'm a big fan myself um that's about it let's let's get into that let's definitely get into that because i think that's why everybody here you know is, is at the tent today right they're interested in monero how did you become Monero, Matt? Why why did you get into Monero? What what drove you to Monero? Um, I just uh, I like the idea of privacy in my trade. I see a time coming when um, regular cash is going to go away. I mean, there's a lot of people who are afraid of that. Um, I'm not so afraid of it as uh, I know that there's already a replacement for that that serves the exact same purpose. Not everybody who's using private, uh, cash for privacy reasons is doing something that's against anybody's grain. They just like their privacy. You know, I see a day coming where if cryptos could be traced, that I could see a government agency sending, uh, requiring you to send a 1099 to the teenager that shovels your sidewalk because you wanted to give them twenty dollars. You know, it's like I don't want to, I don't want to send that kid a 1099 because I wanted to pay him $20 for raking my leaves or mowing my lawn or whatever, you know, pay the babysitter. Well, send her 1099. I mean, that's dumb. But if all of our transactions are tracked, then that seems like the next logical step would be to find a way to tax that money. It's like, why can't we just have little, at least little transactions be anonymous in between people? And I think Monero serves that purpose quite well, which is why I like it. No, I know why they call you Monero Matt. <laughs> What, what's your Monero take? Why, why the interest in Monero at all? Yeah, I think mine is a, it's a bit more holistic too, but plays into what Matt is talking about. 
my my whole thing has been just we need to achieve as much privacy and anonymity in every sector as possible. So inclusive of that is is currency for our everyday transactions because we certainly don't want to be tracked, surveilled, and spied upon by the especially the United States government, which is really a nasty entity. But uh, aside from that, my my whole thing has been we the infrastructure that we use online is largely all completely transparent, right? Even in terms of data storage, Amazon web services, uh, Google, et cetera, they all maintain control, vast control over the internet. So trying to be able to develop infrastructure, we have the financial piece in Monero, but also we need uh, decentralized storage. We need communications protocols and we need to anonymize as much as possible for the singular purpose of allowing developers and engineers to build applications that help us create and generate more privacy and anonymity enhancing tools and allows us to generate more freedom, right? I think this, we can go into more about this later, but the fact that the cryptocurrency community is also under, under assault, there's this theme of, you know, all of us being victims of the state, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, the You guys probably heard the Samurai Wallet guys got arrested. I talked about this in my talk yesterday. The uh, tornado cash guy, Alexi Pertsev, was just sentenced in the, in the Netherlands, and he's going to have to serve a prison sentence. So we we see that crypto is under attack. So we have to have as much anonymity in in every element of our activity and our activism as possible. Matt, you were uh, I don't know how much you want to go into detail on this, or how often you go into detail on this. You were, you witness what ha- what went down with the crypto six you witnessed firsthand the crackdown on cryptocurrency where do you see things going with regards to monero and the u.s government's stance on monero and what they may or may not try to do with regards to monero well i was um like i wasn't really i just lived where the raid happened you know i, I wasn't really a suspect of any kind for any reason um I just happened to be in the wrong place at the, the wrong time. And when it comes to that, I got what I got firsthand was the nature of the people who were doing the raid. There were very frighteningly bad people who were certain that they were correct in what they were doing at the same time as not understanding why they were there. They didn't really understand what was going on or how it all worked, but somebody told them to go a place and do a bad thing and they unquestioningly did it. Um, so what was also interesting to me is when I was questioned, they asked me about Monero and I don't think they understood why they were asking the questions. It was almost as if someone above them had directed them to get answers on this question and the people who were giving the the answers didn't really understand why they were asking in the first place. How did they even know to ask you about you? They already knew you as Monero Matt or something like yeah, yeah. Well, I don't. I mean, I was on the radio show, so I mean, I I wear Monero clothes places. So um, I mean, when the house is under investigation, then people who live in the house are under investigation. So they probably did a full workup on me, you know. Even though I had nothing to do with anything that they were investigating, or you know, I have a very normal life otherwise. You know, it was very very kind of a pedestrian life even. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I was there, and they probably knew everything about me, including that I just happened to like Monero. What was your answer to why you care about Monero to these uh, federal agents? So the, they, they asked me at one point why I like Monero so much, and that was their question. I think it was the U.S. Postal Service guy said, why do you like Monero so much? And I said, because it keeps the business of people like me out from underneath the noses of people like you. And it, a silence fell over the room. And <laughs> and uh, I think they were waiting for more than that. Oh, I don't know if they were waiting for more than that, but... Either way, that was my answer, and it was a true answer, you know, and I don't think they could have thought that I was fibbing to them or covering anything up with that short and direct answer. Uh, There's nothing incriminating about the answer. Um, So um, I think they were kind of flabbergasted that I would say as much at the same time as I don't know if they understood my answer because I don't know if those people realized why they were there in the first place other than that they were directed to be there. Guys. It sounds like just being there, Matt, that is kind of incriminating in and of itself, right? And that's why they probably targeted you. So I would say, actually, you were at the right place at the right time because you got the experience and you got to to understand their behavior. And then you get to impart that insight onto us. But I think that those kinds of situations, the sad thing is that having feds or any kind of police, state police break into people's houses, just an unfortunate tradition of the U.S. empire in the states. And it's just a shame 
that we're having to experience that in order to really invigorate our push back against the state apparatus. And this, all this kind of stuff does is just keep it. It puts us in the spotlight, but it also enhances our movement because now we're able to explain. This is the thing for me. If we can explain in a very personal way, rather than some abstracted philosophy of what happened to us in these kinds of scenarios, that helps us also generate more freedom, gets more people into the movement and gets more people curious about what they can do to help. Right. Because it's now very personal for us. I think that's just a, Side thought. How do we, uh, or do we want to normalize the usage of Monero? If we do, how do we do it? Um, you, you asked, obviously everybody here at, at Porkfest is open to these concepts, right? Everybody here, I'm sure, has Monero, uses Monero, is open to the idea of using Monero. If you go out and talk to Joe Schmo, especially where I'm from in, in New York City, talk to them something about Monero is going to be like, well, why do I care? Why do I need Monero? I could just use Venmo. I could just use PayPal. Um, how, you know, is it, is it Monero? Isn't that the thing that's used for funding terrorism? How do we get beyond that point in the, in the next level of adoption for, for something like Monero? Uh, walk your talk. Um, I like crypto for the same reasons everybody else does, but I've also I've always been a big fan of keeping a little on hand. So if anybody doesn't understand it, I can show them how it works by giving them a little bit. I have a wallet with Doge in it for that purpose, and I like Doge because it's marketable. It's uh, Elon Musk has talked about Doge. People understand Doge because they heard him talk. He's a gigantic mouthpiece, right? So they've heard about Dogecoin. So okay, here's a wallet. Open your Dogecoin with it. Boop. Here's a little bit. Here's two dollars worth. Oh, neat. That was easy. You know, so everybody's used to using a credit card. So in order to spread the word, to show people how easy it is to use this, just the same. It's a scannable QR code. Off it goes, or you know, however your wallet works. That's uh, it's pretty simple to market it. I don't think a lot of crypto people. A lot of crypto people are libertarians, and a lot of libertarians aren't really outgoing people. A lot of them are very introverted people, so they're not the type of people going to go out and market a good idea because they think it's a good idea. You know, they they kind of keep it to themselves, and but I would discourage that. I would say go out there. Every time, whenever I buy something, I ask, do you take crypto, even though I know damn well that they don't. You know, I'm saying, and just makes a person ask, you know, oh, I've heard of that before. Oh, well. I can teach you about it. I don't expect them to take payment that day, but now there's one more person that's asking the right questions, and that's one more person I can maybe at least show them, here's two bucks worth of doge. It's not going to kill me to give them two bucks worth of doge, you know, now they have it, and I teach them at the same time, don't lose your keys, you know, don't don't lose your, don't forget your password to your wallet and whatever, and, and uh, they understand that and how that's important. So I think that's the best way to, to go about getting it out there is to just tell, tell, people, tell people they can use it and show them how to use it. Yeah, just start using it. Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans. And if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, gratuitous, and Monero. Any insight you can give us? I mean, you're your old school crypto guy. Um, you've been at Porkfest for for years, right? Um, what what's your perspective on Monero from when you've seen it in the early days and that, where you see it now? And give, give us your insights there. You have a an interesting viewpoint. So so I I have some regrets because in 2013 I was just day trading crypto a lot on Poloniex back in the day. Just sitting at our island, our kitchen, and at one point I had like millions, <laughs> millions of Monero, and I at the time they were brand new, so I, and I didn't really understand the that te- technology. I don't know why they were important. I didn't wasn't into that yet. It was just an, a hot new coin. I was there for it, so I, I had just a ton of them, and I ended up trading them away and losing like all of it on other just crap coins, you know. So, uh, but I remember the days. Yo, yeah, no, no, no. This is this is legit. I. I, I legit sunk on this one. So, uh, but uh, but those are the old, old days, and there's just a, it was very very inexpensive then. Um, I, I'm I'm of the belief that it's way underpriced now. I don't think people have seen the value of how um, important your privacy is. There's going to come a day when our privacy. I mean, there are, the the government's already showing signs of not caring about our privacy. 
Um, and in our transactions, very important to them. Uh, I think that commerce is the most pure form of language. It's the way people talk to each other in the most honest way. So when you're making transactions with other people, it doesn't matter what it's for. That's a very, very honest way of communicating. Yeah, put your money where your mouth is. So uh, they're going to want to be able to follow those conversations just like they want to eavesdrop on every single other thing we do. So I think the idea that a privacy coin would be more valuable in the future just makes sense to me. Yeah, I have some thoughts to add. So Matt spoke very eloquently about the the use case agenda. And, and to me, that feeds also into the idea that we need to get as much mass adoption in Monero and anonymity as possible. But also think about the ideas in and of themselves, talking about the importance of privacy. There's a lot of people in the United States and elsewhere that don't even think anonymity or privacy is important. Uh, they they think you know, it's the whole idea of what well, you know. What do you have to hide, right? Why do you need to be? Why do you need to be private? But we can think back if we get a little bit of a history lesson. Back in the '90s, the the government effectively had a monopoly on encryption and encryption protocols. Right? It was only through what what's been called the cypherpunk wars of the 1990s that we've been able to figure out a way to bring encryption to the masses. And this was largely done by uh, Whitfield Diffie and Marty Hellman, who worked really hard to work out the, the scheme for public, public private key cryptography. And there, there were other things that happened in the 90s with the government trying to institute clipper chips as well, which were going to be siphon people's data very early on. So trying to explain and express the importance of privacy and anonymity on a very fundamental level as a human right, right? When the, when governments come after privacy and anonymity, that is a human rights violation. And when people are so propagandized and indoctrinated that they sleep on that, then we have to do what we can to also educate them and help them out. That does definitely include everything Matt is saying that's letting them learn how to use the technology and understand its importance. But I'm huge on also the educational component that we explain. Because right now, I mean, this is we live in a vast surveillance state where everybody's met metadata is constantly leaked, where governments just have easy access backdoors to services like Google and Amazon Web Services. It goes back to Jeffrey Tucker's talk when he just discussed this is a, a crypto fascist state effectively where governments have just monopolized all of these industries for their own for their own aims which are all nefarious agendas yeah so that's a good overview we, we had phil zimmerman uh the guy behind the pgp project pretty good privacy he spoke at the first minerotopia so that, that was super cool and uh it got to the point where i was just having kind of conversations with him leading up to it which is which is it was very cool it was very cool to talk to him Although I was surprised when he when he spoke at Monerotopia, obviously. So this guy this guy lived it. He's uh, obviously he's a cypherpunk, right? Uh, he he fought the PGP battles in the '90s um, to basically you, you know win the fight that that code is speech, that encryption is speech. Um, but yeah, he I was surprised to hear from him that he was a little worried about tools like Monero. Uh, being untraceable because it could be used to evade taxes and things. So I'm like hearing this reveal, I'm like, oh my goodness. Like, uh, so, you, you know, people are complex. Uh, even even the early cypherpunks from the 90s, you know, you, see, you never know what uh, everybody's re really uh, thinking and where everybody stands on. So I was, I, that surprised me. Uh, but obviously an amazing individual, and he, he did a ton of, for the space. But it does seem like we're at the point where we're about to potentially relitigate the the pgp wars from the 90s potentially with something like monero i know uh, you know neither of you guys are attorneys or anything but any insight into there of how far things go in the u.s with regards to something like monero do they you know we saw what they did with the samurai wallet uh may, primary difference there being there they were a company that was earning fees on the service of obfuscating your bitcoin transactions with monero it's a protocol it would be a, a much greater breach in terms of our you know our our you know uh, our, our current our current rights right um but do you see things happening with monero in those regards do you think they we we, we have to relitigate what happened in the pgp wars in the 90s with monero i'm not familiar with that but it's interesting to hear about um i would imagine so i mean we know how the government works they push and 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 they push until they get there what they want and it doesn't matter if what they want like i said the people who are in our house are just order followers and most of them didn't know why they were there. They didn't understand any of this stuff. 
If they did, they had a very, very entry level understanding of it. They didn't understand why it would be so important to anybody. Um, I don't even know if they realize there aren't a whole lot of laws against or a regulation on um, the crypto world. They were just doing what they were told to do. Um, but what was your question? How else? I guess, do you see us entering a time where we relitigate the PGP uh, encryption wars in the 90s and they try to do something like ban Monero? Uh, and then, you know, Supreme Court case is... is is free is code free speech? Is encryption free speech? Do people have the right to transact peer to peer using open source software? So, so yeah, that's that's really at the crux of it all. And that's it's not just Monero; it's all cryptocurrency. It's all zeros and ones, and that's a language. Binary language is a binary language. It's a language. So um, that said, it's a, if if the Constitution works, it's a protected right to use language and to communicate. And I just got done saying how the truest form of communication from one person to another the, with the most honesty is a transaction, right? Um, or should be. If it's all everybody's on the up and up, it's a, it's a transaction. Um, so that said, yeah, I think that's a war that's going to continue in, until some regulators. There was just a uh, about a year, I don't know, a year and a half ago, maybe there was a, uh, a Supreme Court case, EPA versus West Virginia. I don't know if you're familiar with that or not, EPA versus West Virginia. So the EPA tried to basically hijack somebody's house because they were on a creek and they were saying it was a navigable waterway and they said so they couldn't build there and and they they really just ruined these people's lives. It ended up going to the the top and the Supreme Court ended up coming back saying um you can't you're you're not a lawmaking agency. You can't you can't have that dictatorial force. So um it threw a lot of cold water on a lot of people in Washington DC because that doesn't just go for the EPA. That's a rule that uh, that goes to all of these alphabet agencies, including the FBI, including the IRS, including the DEA and the FDA. So it doesn't mean they're going to stop pushing, though. Even if it's illegal, the government will do it. And if they're made to disband, it will just go somewhere else. So I don't think those struggles and those wars, the PGP-type wars, are going to stop being um, just because a government agent at any time is told they're not allowed to do that anymore. They're just going to find a different way to do it. Um, that's history shows us that that's the nature of the beast. So, um, but we're just trying to live and do our thing and, you know, not get in anybody's way. Uh, just, I would say, just keep, keep doing your thing and keep living your life and let them come when they come. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of thoughts on this matter. So what, what we've seen with, these attacks on the cryptocurrency ecosystem, especially in in regards to privacy developers and engineers, is that the govern the government is attempting to make a statement, and that statement is that privacy and anonymity are its absolute enemy. And I think, in some ways, this is a good thing because it lets us know that the Leviathan is is struggling, right? I often make you know you've heard the analogy that Le- Le- Leviathan has been dealt its death knell, right? And its tentacles are sweeping the surface of the waters, trying to drag anybody down with it. So so my my belief is that they wouldn't be attacking crypto so devotedly if there wa- if it wasn't actually a threat, especially privacy and anonymity, if it wasn't a threat to the establishment and to their status quo. And so what they're trying to do by going after privacy developers, which is just speech, right, which is just speech, that, that argument's absolutely true, is they're trying to make examples of those folks so they can create what's what they refer to as a chilling effect. So the, the chilling effect is this idea that if we make examples of these people, we throw the book at them, we, we criminalize this whole industry, then that scares people, it terrifies people from actually working to develop privacy and anonymity enhancing tools and it's an absolute tragedy but here is here's the alternative to that here's the good sign we're we're working very deeply in the cryptocurrency ecosystem this is inclusive of monero and monero developers trying to develop infrastructure that does provide more anonymity so these guys can work without having to worry about being attacked and assaulted by government agents this is what Amir Taki and his team at DarkFi have called the development of a dark forest infrastructure. So the dark forest is this dark canopy where cyber gorillas can operate for the purposes of trying to generate more human rights and more freedom through those anonymity enhancing technologies. And some would even go so far as to say, this is me personally, that their ultimate aim is actually to destabilize the nation state. Because, again, the nation state's just a parasitical monopoly 
over violence that harms our lives every step of the way. So we have to continue pushing these ideas forward. And we can't forget that that central thesis of what cryptocurrency was built for. Fantastic. Uh, guys, any, you know, we're, we're talking about like uh, the, the cypherpunk way, the crypto anarchist way. Um, is there any value in, you know, uh, getting involved in politics, uh, choosing your president based on what they may or may not do with crypto? Or is it is that all a waste of time and we just have to keep our head down, build out the code, use it among ourselves? Is there any value in tangling with uh, tangoing with the current system? We have, you know, Trump saying that he'll free Ross on day one if he if he's elected president. He seems to be espousing ideas of, of like free speech and this idea of letting free speech take of uh, tech flourish. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I think the answer to that is all the above. There's enough of us and enough varied opinions where we can attack this on all fronts. Everybody chips away at the beast and the beast loses when you're because we are literally the antithesis of them. We are not only a balance of them. We are the death of them just by our very existence. The cryptocurrency genie's out of the bottle, and it's never going back in. And then just to really drive it home, there's there's privacy coins. So um, if everybody, some people want to take government office here or there, if you want to go be a, an administrator in XYZ Bureau or whatever, that's maybe it's a great idea. It's probably a great idea if you can do it, if they'll let you. Um, you know, But after a while they can only investigate so many of us before they start losing resources. And then by the way, you know, so, I mean, a thousand people, I mean, how many people are here? 1500, 2000 people, just the people on this campground are a formidable force. If they take action, if you do nothing, then you're going to get nothing. And, or you're going to make a lot of work for other people because they have to double down on what their, their duties are to what their goals are. I like my freedom. You know, I, I like freedom for everybody and I want everybody to have as much as possible. The, the most, powerful economy in the history of the earth was built on freedom until it started becoming regulated and next thing you know we're less and less and less free all the time with more and more and more regulation so people aren't caring as much as they did back in the seven late 1700s it's time to start caring again so yeah take office run for office do be, be subversive any way you can possibly be I, i'd recommend a um there's a libertarian convention a long time ago where robert anton wilson and carl hess took the stage and just they passed a joint back and forth between each other talking about the early days of libertarianism and this was like 1983 so uh and and they were it was called subversion for fun and profit is what they called the talk and i recommend everybody look up subversion for fun and profit and listen to like all two hours of the chat because it was hilarious and great and uh they had their they had their finger on the pulse back then and we can do that again and a lot of us are so run the ball one quick fantastic so I reminded of a quote by Robert Anton Wilson. He said, when the world starts to look more largely like a maximum security prison, the only thing, the only sane thing to do is to plan a jailbreak. <laughs> hey, Robert Anton. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, let's open it up to the audience for questions. I'm nobody formerly known as uh, Rich Paul. I've, uh, I'm probably best known these days as a member of the uh, Crypto Six. Uh it, when they drove a tank into his house, that was my house too, and also my church. And I was one of those arrested for felony charges that amounted basically to contempt of bank. Because what fraud means in the real world is to tell somebody a lie and trick them into giving you some property that isn't yours. But then the feds have this version that they call wire fraud. And wire fraud is is uh, making any false statement to a financial institution, regardless of whether that imposes a, a cost on them or puts you in. And, and that is very important. You can't say this isn't for crypto. They will put you in prison for that if they don't like you. So if you're sending wire transfers or whatever, don't ever lie to a bank. They don't need an intent to defraud to convict you. And that's... An important message, but the but the message I got up here because the question was about Trump was uh, I, I'm a one issue Trump voter, and uh, that issue is he's got a hostage, and you know Joe Biden doesn't have a hostage. Joe Biden has a prisoner, but Trump's got a hostage. Well, I'd rather be a hostage than be a prisoner. 
So once he made the statement that he would pardon Ross, I said, well, unless I run into into Ross's mom at Porkfest and she says, don't do it, then I'm going to I'm going to vote for Ross is what I'm going to do. Um, and uh, and she didn't say, don't do it. And uh, and I really want to form an, uh, an organization. If anybody's interested, it's called Anarchists for Trump. Our slogan is vote for Trump. He's got a hostage. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the uh, and the other thing that I'm going to want to talk about that might he, I might be able to get him to co-sign is I know that what I saw happen to Donald Trump in Georgia, in New York, all over this country, that was a railroad job. And I know that because I've been inside two railroad jobs and I've watched a whole number of them from the outside as they went after political enemies. I know what it looks like and that's what it looks like when they switch, stretch the rules oh so much, oh so much, just enough that anything you may have done can be turned into a felony. And that is what I learned from my lawyers this time around, that nothing is legal in America. Some things are just harder than other things to prosecute. You're never on safe legal ground. As long as you are under the rule of a corporation that does not have a soul, does not have a conscience, but does have a license to kill and is authorized and is and is answerable only to itself you are never you can never be and you will never be safe the only way to be safe is to burn that motherfucker to the ground uh, my take on monero is that when you buy a cryptocurrency part of what you're buying maybe all of what you're buying is the right to trade with the cur with the community that trades in that currency you're you're entering into a market with other people and if they're good people it will be a good experience and if they're not good people it won't be well i'll tell you what i got polluted a couple days ago and uh and i went out and i i bought a couple drinks and i paid with uh monero and i accidentally sent the guy an eight thousand dollar tip this is very embarrassing when you're like the Pope of a crypto church. But luckily, luckily he gave it back to me as a miracle because I, I hadn't figured out, I'd spent Monero a bunch of times and I hadn't figured out who I had sent too much to. I just knew there was nothing left in my wallet, so I must have spent too much. I either sent, sent too much or I really drank too much. So... <laughs> So before I could even figure out who it was, I'm walking down the road in Porkfest, and this guy comes running up to me and he goes, you sent me way too much money last night. And I was like, I like this community. <laughs> you know, this is the kind of community I want to be a part of. So peace. It is true. Uh, the, the, you know, the Monero community uh, has, has, has good people, and I'd say skeptical people, people that are always like very self-skeptical skeptical not treating it like religion just treating it like tech um i heard someone mentioned that if you went out and pitched to businesses that their transaction costs would be a lot less with monero that would be um, that would be a really good way to uh extend adoption and then the other thing is I was hearing someone say, you know, we could get raw milk with this. Unfortunately, where I live, first of all, raw milk is kind of illegal. But where I get mine is like a Mennonite community. And they're totally like cash only, um, very anti-tech. So um, don't know how that would work, but maybe I can pitch it. To yeah, you. If, you, if you get them accepting Monero, that would be, that'd be impressive. Um but yeah, it's it is it's it's a it's a gray area, which is why maybe it's it's a good candidate for early adoption for Monero, right? To be able to buy your raw milk in an unstoppable way. There's an important thing to reflect on: if you get convicted of perjury, you're likely to do four years. If you get convicted of making any false statement to a bank, twenty eight. So just so we know who's running the show, strict liability. Guys, any any thoughts on? Like adoption, Monero adoption, like how, how do we, any thoughts on how we get people to actually start using it to live off of? 
I've recently launched XMRBizarre.com. Just any, any, uh, you guys have been, you know, in crypto for a while, especially you. Thoughts on how we continue to grow out the Monero peer to peer economy? It's a, it's uphill and it's going to be a constant fight. And like I said, for me, it's just a matter of showing people. I show people all the time, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make a rationale as to why it might be important to them in the future. Um, some of my favorite people to go after have been like the Christians who are like, you know, crypto is the mark of the beast and or whatever. I'm like, well, watch this. Let me let me show you what is and what this one in particular does, you know, and then it, might, it pulls some of them back from the edge. of be like, oh, OK, well, that is a little contrary to what I thought it all was, you know, so um, it's going to be a hearts and minds thing. It's going to be able to show it being used in practical, like in in practice, you know, um, like I said, I always offer, um, somebody mentioned asking storefronts. Um, that's a very popular thing for us to do in Keen. We're always trying to get the storefronts to, to accept. Um, I spent 28 years in the restaurant industry. I couldn't imagine working in the restaurant industry and not taking crypto. I know what it costs to run a restaurant. And if I wanted to generate some, that's a, that's a business that I would be in that I would totally be willing to accept crypto even if i was just waiting tables you know talk to your waiter you know maybe the waiter has always been interested in crypto but never had it they're walking around with a bank and at the end of the night they have to pay for all the food they've sold they might want to take some out of their bank and just keep the crypto for themselves and pay the restaurant out of the bank so there's a person right there who can get involved with crypto just in a regular old total stranger to stranger transaction very run-of-the-mill yeah oh yeah yeah for sure for sure um, the slow part is you have to set them up with a wallet first. Yeah. Like you have to teach people how to download a wallet and how to, you know, but that's, that's not hard. That's simple. Yeah, I, I do it all the time. I tip in Monero all the time. Plug and play designed specifically for, for running a Monero node. So kind of like a, a Roku and that it's very simple to use, plug it in, power it up, connect it to your Wi-Fi. Uh, it, it's, it syncs and now you're running your own Monero node. And then when you use Monero, when you use a when when you use your own Monero wallet, you can connect it to your node. So now when you're using Monero, sending transactions, you're communicating with your own node, and effectively nobody knows you're using Monero that way. So it just adds more security and privacy. It also adds security to the network by adding redundancy, having more nodes running more copies of the blockchain. Thanks, thanks for allowing me to shield the node. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I, th- I think it's an important part of, of growing out the ecosystem. XMR Bazaar is another thing that I'm really interested in because I think, you know, we just need ways of using it. Uh, like this gentleman was saying before, you know, it's, it's about the community that you're opting into to now start to transact with. And I see platforms like X- XMR Bazaar just being the, like the trust and reputation engine of the Monero community, bringing people together and allowing to, to participate in commerce in a trustful way because now you're doing it directly there is no middleman so you need to know when you're buying you know the, the used motorcycle off of this guy that he'll actually deliver it right so I, I look at his his trust and his reputation on the site i see he's had successful trades in the past we use uh the multi-sig fi- feature on xmr bazaar i've now sent him digital cash he transferred uh, the motorcycle so we we need tools like that i'm excited about that for purposes of really getting people to start using it um, and by the way, there's, there's no fees taken on XMR Bazaar. We're, we're never a part of a transaction. It's really just the trust and reputation feature that we offer where people create profiles. It can be as anonymous as they like, uh, but for reasons of being as competitive as possible and just for legal reasons, right? For all of what we're talking about, right? I don't want to be viewed as a money transmitter. We don't take any, any, any fees. It's all peer to peer. And even the escrow. We, we never hold your Monero. It uses multi-signature, Monero multi-signature. So the, there's, a, you know, there's the buyer, the seller, and then the third party that signs is, is the mediator. So there's mediators on the platform. They set their own fee. They're not XMR Bazaar. They're their own you know, independent agents. And uh, they, you know, the site functions that way. Yeah, interesting thoughts on... This is just what I call mass adoption, trying to get people to engage with Monero and to actually use it on a day-to-day basis. I'm thinking along the same strategies that we considered when I was working with Roger at Bitcoin.com. And his whole mission was, yes, we need to get as many people to use this as possible. We need to go to events. We need to go to communities. We need to get them to download wallets. We need to get them to use, actually use the technology. 
And you know that strategy was working because what Roger was promoting in this this mass use case and, and adoption ended up getting him into the position that he's in now where he became a target of the government. He wrote a book called Hijacking Bitcoin, right? Because look what, and this is a good test of what can happen when you actually start to threaten the status quo. So uh, Bitcoin and that community, as a lot of it, a lot of us have seen has become ossified. As a matter of fact, they push the idea of ossification to make that technology as unusable as possible, right? So if we're if we're trying to spread Monero and get people to use Monero, it has to continue to be usable. It has to be continue to be adoptable, and we have to watch for the that uh, those attempts to hijack the technology, which will inevitably occur as the government continues to target technologies that represent a threat to its hegemony on power. For sure. Yeah. A lot of that I think has to do with the culture of the project itself. It needs to have a strong immune system. I think, I think Bitcoins is, is the immune system is, is too strong. It's attacking itself with its, with its maximalism, but it needs to, it needs to have a cohesive vision where everybody's on board. And I think in Monero, everybody's on board with the vision of unstoppable, untraceable digital cash and making all design decisions towards, towards that end. For sure. I mean, I think that's the most important thing to, to remember. And when they when they set out to call you a terrorist or whatever, you got to remember that almost all of the money that's ever been used in actual terrorism has been government issued money. And that is true today. And, and they're not using Bitcoin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. PayPal. Um, so any, anything that's a fast way to transact value is going to get used for the wrong reasons. Um, people will say it's for the the underworld and the druggies and stuff like I, I love Monero. I absolutely hate drugs. I'm a, I'm pretty straight edge. I hardly ever even drink. Like I, I might have a, a little shot of bourbon, bourbon like once every six months. Um, but I love Monero and, uh, I'm not doing anything underhanded. There's nothing illegal about what I'm up to ever. <clears throat> I'm so above board. It's not funny, but I know how important privacy is. And privacy is important to me and it will always be important to me. And I can see a day coming when my privacy doesn't matter to somebody with a badge. So I want to make sure that I always have some layer of privacy over my life that I can always hold and maintain. That's, that's why I'm sticking to it. When you refer to the ossification of Bitcoin, do you mean um, do you mean that you think they're going to try to use that as a, uh, a base currency from which to do fractional reserve banking? Essentially, I think that's an interesting way of looking at it, but I'll let these guys chime in. Yeah, t- uh, t- typically the idea is, and this is the way we've thought about it a lot, is that it makes Bitcoin simply un- unusable, right? The original vision that Satoshi Nakamoto had for Bitcoin was that it would be peer-to-peer electronic cash. And now that, that vision has metamorphosed into this idea that it's just digital gold. So its its usability has been handicapped and usurped by various entities that are trying to push that particular agenda for Bitcoin. You see people like Michael Saylor, you know, going out talk now talking about KYC is good, having uh, government ETFs are good, and, and so making Bitcoin an an adjunct or an asset of the financial industrial complex is exactly what those got what the agenda is for that currency. So this is really to me Bitcoin is a cautionary tale for the things that can go wrong in a crypto ecosystem. And to speak what Doug's to speak to what Doug said, you do have to have a strong community and a strong culture and you have to have that that immunology built into that that cultural ethos. If not, that's like likely to happen. So the the, the funny way that you represented what's happened to Bitcoin is that it started to kind of eat itself, right? That's kind of, that's a basically a cancer. It just turned in on itself. So, and I, I'm really sad that that went that way because I was working with Bitcoin.com and Roger very closely when the scaling debate of 2014, 2015 was happening. And I saw very clearly that because the whole, the modus operandi here is to destabilize the financial system, right? To be able to bring mass adoption to allow people to use cryptocurrency on a daily basis because that takes power away from the dollar as the world reserve currency, right? And if we can do that, that definitely handicaps and adds a, an element of damage to that particular system. So I think that's why now uh, even Monero, but also outside of Monero in the cryptocurrency ecosystem, where we're thinking so importantly about anonymity and privacy too, is being built into these tech 
technologies. So that does make it easier for us to do that as well. But there's that cultural piece and there's that social engineering that we also have to get over. And that that definitely will be the the psychology and the internals of those communities. Yeah, I think uh, Bitcoin has essentially been defanged because of its transparent nature. Uh, the state really does not fear Bitcoin, right? Even when you when you see uh, you know um, testimony take place in in the, in the halls of Congress, ultimately the questions come down to, but you know, it, is it? Don't worry, it's actually more traceable than the U.S. dollar. We can see where all the transactions are going, and that's ultimately what they fear, right? It's not just about the government not being able to print more money. If they can track and trace perfectly the money that you're using, that they could perfectly assess taxes. And what are they really, what is really the threat at that point? They have all your information. They know what you're doing with your money at any given time. They could pro- essentially, uh, like we, we talk about with CBDCs, programmatically control your, your, your money. With Bitcoin, maybe they can't control the protocol itself, but they can control the way you interface with the protocol if they can track and trace everything. In addition to that, they can perfectly, they could perfectly tax the ledger and its use. Yeah, I see. I see Bitcoin as a as a as a prototype, and it was a great prototype. Yeah, it, it was just it's just a it, it proved that there was you know we're not necessarily trying to destabilize economies. We're trying to replace the tools that economies are using to get along. Like everybody gets along every day, and. All that's happened in the last hundred years is some people behind some walls using some stats we're not allowed to know are destabilizing the very currency that they're issuing. And we lose ninety nine and a half percent of our buying power over a hundred years. It's like what what kind of company issues a product that destroys itself on a calculated level over a hundred years? That just seems like a really weird thing to me. So it's clear that these people either are evil and doing this on purpose, or they're very, very bad at being um, uh, stewards of that of that product and service. So let's let's have some competition in that marketplace. I don't think that introducing cryptocurrency or privacy coins is going to destabilize because the way you know some of us are bummed that it's taking so long to see adoption, a mass adoption. I'm not really, because I think the fact that it is moving in slowly and more and more people are organically adopting cryptocurrency and privacy coins, um, I think what it's happening is it's creating an organic overtake that will just naturally happen. The powers that be might have a little more time to think about how they're going to handle that, but they're centralized. We're not. And that is where they will always lose. So I don't think destabilizing the economy is a problem there. I think it's just naturally going to become a part of it. People will get used to having, you know, I mean, a long, long time ago, I traded foreign currency. You know, I was in a foreign currency exchange and I would try to make a little bit of money if I could on yen or South African rand or or whatever. And now it, there's just more. There's already people who've been trading currencies for a long time. This is just a digital version of that. That's uh, in each one of these digital currencies has its own little uh, features that people might like more or less. You know, they're not trading against value so much. Maybe they're buying it for different reasons. And it's, up. you know, why people take on cryptocurrency is up to them. I do it for my reasons. You've all heard. Um, there might be somebody who has an entirely different reason. None of us have even thought of why they would want to be involved. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be an organic kind of uptake and none of us need to worry too much. We keep, you know, stay the course is what I do, you know. That's- yeah, I think the organic uptake is also allowing it to organically scale too, right? Yeah. So it's not overnight you're going from 1,000 transactions to 100,000 transactions. Monero is at like 20,000 daily transactions. If there was a a recent bump up where we went up to like 40,000, but you know, it has dynamic block size and it could just scale with actual real world demand. And it's not really being used for speculation, but actual use. Yeah. yeah. 2022 in Austin and uh, Edward Snowden spoke. And, you know, that's a very kind of establishment crypto. Well, not, I mean, it was very pro Bitcoin, but yeah, Zcash. But, but what was interesting. Um, he gave like he was very concerned about the development in Bitcoin and the lack of, you know, they've really moved away from privacy. But I know I heard on your podcast recently, you said, you know, as most people know, he was involved in the development of Zcash and he's kind of been disparaging about Monero in the past. But then you mentioned that you were kind of you'd like to talk to him. But during that conference, he actually spoke very highly of Monero and he said, 
it's actually great and I use it a lot and I have. And he said, it's, you know, I think he made a reference to those comments in the past. So I just, I don't know if you knew that, but I thought you'd be interested. Yeah, I did hear that. We tried to get him as a speaker at Monerotopia. We were talking to like his agent here. Um, I was trying to get him to accept Monero to be a speaker at Monerotopia remotely. But I think he's now mentioning Monero more and more. But we don't have him as a speaker at Monerotopia, but we'd love to get him. So I, I live in a, in Manchester, Vermont. I've always wondered if we could somehow set up a network to shop for people um, so that uh, people could like, the business owners could just start taking, adopting Monero and, and have like a, a, somehow a league of um, people who use it. And I wonder if you think that's possible. And um, yeah, no, that's what I was trying to get to again with XMR Bazaar, right? So we need to get the community using it. So on XMR Bazaar, you can make business listings. There's also Monerica, where it's a listing of all, not all, but anybody that's been discovered that accepts Monero, any businesses. Um, but yeah, I think these are the ways we need basically something that's that's tracks the users of Monero without revealing their identity per se and lets the world know that they're looking to engage with others and, and use Monero. So years ago, our company tried to promote a lot of merchant adoption. At the time, it was Bitcoin only. Monero didn't exist. And the biggest hurdle that we saw for merchants was that they had their own point of sale system. And Bitcoin at the time just was this other phone that was always not charged, lost, or in the hands of the owner who happened to not work that day. Are there any projects that are building that aren't just crypto, but actually incorporate even the fiat side so that a business owner can just do everything in one and not have to train their staff to also learn how to do this other device, other software. So that way it's, you know, point of sale, it maybe even faces the customer. And if I'm making coffee as a barista, I don't even know what they're using. They could swipe a card, tap a phone, scan a QR code, pay Monero, and it's all in one and there's no training involved. I'd love to see that. I don't know if there's any projects underway that I can refer people to because I know enough merchants that want to accept, but this is their hurdle. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I don't think that's kind of the holy grail, right? Nobody's really cracked that cracked that code yet in a, in, a, in a good way. I know BTC Pay Server is a pretty good implementation, but yeah, it's not like it's not really built into current POS systems where it's instantaneous. And if you're using Square Pay now, you just add Monero. Um, yeah, I don't think I don't think we're there yet. I know, like with the Noto, we have ideas with things we we want to do. Maybe turn that into something that uh, storefronts can use to easily accept Monero. There are ways you can currently do it, but yeah, there's no real like plug and play, super easy solution yet. Uh, for people who you know don't have meat space places, um, just using it on your website is fairly easy at this point, as you know, like using the WordPress plugs in plugins, the Monero gateway, BTC Pay server. Uh, now payments has gotten to the point where it's as easy as connecting, you know, PayPal or anything. So, but yeah, in terms of physical acceptance at stores, nobody's really cracked that one yet. Um, for merchant at the moment, uh, there's um, Rhino Wallet that um, offers businesses a way for so they can have like their um, employees have also like access to the wallet without being able to spend the funds of the business and um, also you can like just like a lot of merchants do here uh, they just just print out their um, QR code and then have a maybe a view only wallet so they can see the incoming transactions so we are getting there but the systems aren't perfect but if like you're a, a small business I think you can easily do this already so if you have any questions yeah, reach out to the Monero community and they will gladly have you. I don't recommend the buying or selling of any cryptocurrency to anyone just for, uh, you know, disclaimer purposes. But uh, if it's for you, then maybe you should. Um, I think everybody in this circle of listening probably is well on board. There's a guy sitting in the front with a Rothbard hat on. So I, I don't think that's Henry Kissinger on that hat. So, um, uh or Dave, or, or David Friedman. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm glad that I was asked to be a part of this today. And, um, you know, after going through, a, going through a raid over cryptocurrency, and those people were there for a lot of the wrong reasons, man. I mean, they, they, they were, these are, we, I, I am comfortable now more than ever that I, that we're on the right side of history here. So, uh, yeah, 
I'm going to stay my course. I can, I can speak for myself on that. Nice, man. That's an important message. Yeah, my thought always just goes back to the original impetus of, of Bitcoin, right? In the Genesis block, Satoshi had etched Chancellor on the brink of second bailout. The idea there was clear that this technology was meant to fight back against a corrupt and broken system. And I think if we're not leveraging all of our technologies and our cryptocurrencies for those purposes, then we're actually not be, we're not able to create the kind of lasting paradigmatic change that we're actually trying to push forward. So I really want to just continue to pr help promote those ideas as much po as possible. And I would encourage you all to continue promoting the ideas as much as the technology, because I think just having an understanding of the cypherpunk agenda behind everything is just so important because everything's become so commercialized and institutionalized that it's lost its spirit. The zeitgeist of the technology has been just complete. It's, it's almost completely vanished in some segments of the population. So I would like to try to reinvigorate that as much as possible every step of the way. Fantastic, man. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly shill two things. One again, just as a recap, xmrbizarre.com. If you guys want to, you know, start using Monero, post a service, anything, something you're selling, something you're looking to buy, xmrbizarre.com. Got to get it go. We just got to get people creating profiles, creating listings. Um, and the second thing I'll shill is monerotopia.com. We're doing a Monero conference down in Mexico City in November. I believe you'll be there. I don't know if, we're, if we could if we could somehow drag you down there. Um, Paul's Paul, right? I think uh, yeah, good good chance. He was he was there last year. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a great conference. Four days. We have a Monero accepting marketplace built into the conference. It's in Mexico City. We have Monero devs giving talks down there, and then we have a bunch of different privacy tech projects: Xano, DarkFi, Tari. Uh, a bunch of different projects that'll be involved presenting their their tech as well. So it's good stuff. Thanks, guys. This is awesome that uh, we actually got our little crowd here. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, you too. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to our show on YouTube, Odyssey, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Go to MoneroTalk.live to subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.